Okay, moving back one more box. Uh, however, it's, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay, moving back one more box. Now, instead of perinatal hormone stuff, early environment, what about genes? What about genes? What do genes have to do with aggression, competition, cooperation, empathy, etc.? It used to be, not that long ago, if you even raised the possibility that there were genetic elements to aggression, you would be hounded out of certain realms of social science. It was viewed as wildly incorrect, wildly offensive, hidden agendas out the wazoo. For some reason, this began to pass in the early 90s or so. There were studies in the mid-80s, studies conferences in the mid-80s, where there were protests, they were picketed, because because in this meeting that was considering the sociology of aggression, the this of aggression, the biology, the genetics, the inclusion of it was the grounds for the picketing. A number of those were canceled by the National Institutes of Health under public pressure of certain interest groups, all of that. It used to be viewed as outrageously offensive, the notion that genes have anything to do with aggression. So there's two ways of showing that that's wrong. The first is to sit somebody down and make them go through the last 15 lectures in this class. Or the other is to reflect on the fact that you would leave like a three-year-old in the care of a basset hound, but not with a pit bull. Oh, there are breed-specific differences in behavior. That, if nothing else, is a demonstration of it, that dog breeds have been bred for 20,000 years or so to differ in levels of aggression, in levels of affiliation, all of that. People who, for some bizarre reason, follow bullfighting, there are lines of bulls, different ranches in Spain and Mexico, where they have been famous for centuries for the particular fighting style of the bulls that they breed their children. Genes have something to do with it. Of course they do, because hormones have something to do with it. And because receptors and because enzymes and everything with that, it is impossible to have talked about any of the stuff on the far right of the chart without invoking genes. A ludicrous view. So what is known about the relevance of genes to aspects of aggressive behavior? First off, at this stage, there's been a whole bunch of studies, many of them winding up in some very visible journals, where people find a gene implicating it in abnormal levels of aggression, one of those sorts of behaviors. Typical strategy, these might be genetically engineered animals to remove that gene, or there might be a spontaneous mutation. And all of these report that these are animals, with a whole bunch of these mutations, um, that these are animals with abnormally high levels of aggression. That's kind of a clean experiment. If you go in, and thanks to a mutation, or chopping out one particular gene, and now you've got a lot more aggression in that individual, that kind of suggests that that gene has something to do with aggression, perhaps a whole lot. What are all the problems with that? other ways that that gene could be affecting behavior, which indirectly winds up getting to aggression. One possibility. What if that's a gene that is relevant to impulsivity? And this is an individual who, if you gave the mouse a different realm of tests, would be you know, shouting its love to the world at an impulsively high rate, just as it's being aggressive at an impulsively high rate. Maybe it's a gene having to do with impulsivity. Maybe it's a gene having to do with one of the things we heard in the last lecture, what are the environmental releasing stimuli that cause aggression to occur? What's one of the most reliable ones? Pain. Oh, it turned out a number of these strains of mice that were identified with a gene knockout that here's a gene which can cause aggression. It turned out that these were genes that made animals that were much more sensitive to pain and they were more likely in a pain state to displace aggression onto something else. Or, as was shown in some of these, these were animals who were more aggressive, but they were also more affiliative, and they were more everything. Their just level of arousal, their generic level of arousal, was a lot higher. So all these caveats, an awful lot of the genes that popped up in the first generation of those sorts of studies that looked solid, that were replicated, a lot of them instead had to do with indirect routes rather than directly with aggression itself. So what about the genes that have held up? 
and the really like plausible candidate ones, we've covered some of these already. The serotonin synthesis genes and the serotonin receptor genes and the dopamine receptor genes, all of those have been very solidly implicated. Really careful research, the molecular biologists teaming up with behaviorists who knew what they were doing, ah, genetic components. And what you know by now that it's absolutely about is this, this figure again. That's the case with all of these genes. Oh my god, it's not genes causing aggression. We know exactly this one, modulation, all that stuff, again, depending on the environment and the environment in the realm of genes relevant to aggression, the environment is overwhelmingly about abuse and stress early in life. So that's about as far as the genes will get you there, which is plenty good because this is exactly how the genes should be relevant to behavior. This is how all genes are relevant to behavior. Remember our ultimate punchline from the behavior genetics. At the end of the day, it actually doesn't make any sense to ever say what any gene does, only what it does in the following range of environments. In terms of that, what you are beginning to find is this still sort of growing field which is beginning to look at differences in these genotypes, these different versions of these genes in different populations, in different cultures. And that's just beginning as a literature. I'm not impressed enough with the findings yet that it's worth passing them on, but that is going to be a very interesting field. Finally, there's always this puzzle with any of these of, oh, you've got some gene that's predisposing you towards being aggressive if you were abused in childhood. We still know nothing in terms of that gene. That gene's got no predictive power as to whether this will thus be someone who grows up and is a sociopathic murderer, or if this is someone who grows up and is just an unbelievably nasty monopoly player. That factor again, that same deal. Ooh, major frontal cortical damage, disinhibition, you can't regulate your behavior. No science in terms of the neurobiology as to why one turns into a serial murderer and the other one who doesn't catch clues that the family wants to eat dinner. Again, it's the same puzzle over and over. And again, you could begin to guess what the differences are going to be. Problems in some of these realms with these aggressive genes and different upbringings, different stabilities and families, different relationships, different role models, you can be off and running with that one.